question. How do you make the United States Congress do what you want it to do? Answer. Buy it. How can that be done? By making sure that a majority of senators and Congress persons are in your pocket, so to speak. You mean bribe them? If supporting candidates with massive campaign contributions so that they will do your bidding if they are elected is bribery, then yes, you've hit the nail on the head. But isn't bribery illegal? It should be, but very little seems to be done about it. The staggering amounts of money spent on U.S. elections means that it is virtually impossible to tell where campaign contributions originate. And to make things easier, the United States Supreme Court in January 2010 reversed 20 years of restrictions on corporate campaign contributions. If I wanted to buy Congress, which candidates should I choose? Democrats or Republicans? Both. Then you can't lose. The winner does what he's told. And the loser isn't going to report you for breaking campaign contribution rules because they've already accepted your tainted money in return for promises to further your political agenda. The system is as safe as houses: the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. But who would have enough money to do all this? That's an easy one: IPAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And if you're wondering where they get the money from, a lot of it comes from the American taxpayer. Every year, loyal U.S. citizens dutifully pay their federal taxes, which are then used for many purposes. One of which is to supply aid in various forms to Israel, currently estimated at being about three billion dollars per year. Some of this aid is used to buy U.S.-made weapons. Which allow Israel to continuously threaten its neighbors and enables them to finance the hugely expensive apartheid wall, effectively fencing off the Palestinians and making them prisoners in their own land. It is self-evident that some of this money is bound to find its way back to the United States to be used to top up the election campaign funds for politicians, who, when elected, will be very keen to vote even more aid to Israel next time around. So, not only are American taxes being used to support the apartheid state of Israel, some of that money is being used to help elect candidates who are more interested in getting re-elected than they are in America's best interests. Which means that Americans are actually paying for the demise of their own democracy. Yet democracy is something which successive U.S. presidents have been crying out is a basic right for everyone on the planet. What hypocrisy! It doesn't much matter which candidate wins, Democrat or Republican, or at what level—congressperson, senator, vice president, or president. He or she, having taken the proverbial thirty pieces of silver, is now expected to do IPAC bidding. The penalty for not doing so being the withholding of campaign funds when the next election circus comes to town. But before that happens, the IPAC circus is coming to town, Washington, that is. May 22nd to May 24th, 2011. But before we take a look at their agenda, I want to explain my pronunciation of the name. In all of these words, the AI combination sounds different: diamond, daily, pair. So we have a choice. I suspect that the organization prefers APAC to deflect attention away from the fact that it has little to do with A for America or A Americans. So I prefer to call it IPAC because it is definitely I for Israel centric, as we shall see. The IPAC policy conference is the pro-Israel community's preeminent annual gathering. The event attracts more than 6,000 community and student activists from all 50 states, and more than half of the Senate, a third of the House of Representatives, and countless Israeli and American policymakers and thought leaders. And so on and so forth, but it's a one-way street. Take a look at some of the issues on the agenda. You won't find much that has to do with America or Americans. Example: Israel didn't like the Goldstone report on its savage attack on Gaza in December 2008 and January 2009, so IPAC pushed the United States Senate to vote to rescind United Nations support for the report and take no further action against Israel under its recommendations. The resolution, which passed by unanimous consent on April 14th and was sponsored by Senators Kirsten Gillibrand and Jim Risch, 
comes after Justice Richard Goldstone retracted the central claims of his controversial report that falsely accused Israel of targeting civilians during its caste-led military campaign. For the record, Goldstone, who was a Zionist, was put under enormous pressure by Israel to make his retractions, but the Pandora's box of Israeli atrocities had already been opened. Four people died here, all women, shot. Having bulldozed the place, the Israelis destroyed the village water tower. The only houses left standing were those the occupying troops had camped in, or positioned snipers in. In the house they'd occupied, Israeli soldiers left some writing on the wall. Gaza, here we are, one read. You can run, but you can't hide. Make war, not peace. Arabs need to die. If you can take it, there is worse to come. Zaitun, a few miles north, also flattened by Israeli bulldozers. But in this house, they'd herded 100 members of the Samuni clan. And then they shelled it, killing 49 of them. The mass funeral wake is in its final day. In September 2009, Judge Goldstone had this to say. The mission concluded that actions amounting to war crimes, and possibly in some respects crimes against humanity, were committed by the Israel Defense Force. But in his recent retraction, Goldstone now characterizes the killing of 29 members of the Samuni family as an accident. She's saying if, if, if it was an accident, why they could enter uh, our home with 18 member in it and kill my husband, murder him in front of all of these kids. So why are these two trying to cover up Israel's appalling human rights record? And what's the going rate for that service rendered by this pair of Roman Catholic senators, one Democrat and one Republican? 30 pieces of silver for their campaign coffers? Or a bit more to take care of inflation? Or what about swimming pools for their back gardens? I wonder if they've seen what the IDF did with their battle tanks in some poor Palestinian's back garden, or rather the agricultural fields that their very livelihoods depend upon. Someone will flag this video as inappropriate. If I show the bodies of some of the over 300 children killed, or some of the over 1600 injured in that walled and fenced in prison, but I can show you pictures of those responsible for their deaths and horrific injuries. There are many other Israel-centric issues on its 2011 agenda, but this attempt at covering up the Goldstone report says it all as to what IPAC is really all about. Trying to protect apartheid Israel from its ever-growing number of critics. It is unconscionable, and every decent American should rise up and shout, Enough is enough. In this graphic, the orange represents the population of the United States approximately 310 million citizens, while the P represents the membership of IPAC, a mere 100,000 people, a pressure group whose clearly stated aims and ambitions put the interests of Israel above and beyond any other consideration. Which means that IPAC is, to all intents and purposes, the voice of America. And only when the voices of the majority of United States citizens are heard will this gross imbalance be redressed. This organization is doing something about it, aptly named Move Over IPAC. Look them up on the internet and give them all the support you can. Others to look for are Stop IPAC and Students Against IPAC. How much longer can America afford to be squeezed for money, armaments, and the lives of its children in conflicts that have little strategic benefit for Americans, but which are turning more and more of the world against them? Take America back before it's too late.